What a glorious God, oh, what a powerful Savior, all creation cries out around you, holy is the Lord, oh, what a glorious God, oh, what a powerful Savior, mercy, grace, and goodness surround you, oh, what a glorious God, oh. Good evening. Welcome to the evening services of the Northfield Church of Christ for uh, Sunday, May the 2nd. We will be singing a few songs from our songbooks, Songs of Faith and Praise. Uh, we will observe the Lord's Supper, and uh, then I will deliver a message that I hope will be enlightening and edifying to all of us. So let's get started with our songs. If you would turn your songbook, please, to number 51. <clears throat> 51. We'll sing all three verses. 51. Father of mercies, day by day my love to thee grows more and more. Thy gifts are strewn upon my way like sands upon the great seashore. Like sands upon the great seashore. Father of mercies, God of love, whose gentle gifts all creatures share, the rolling seasons as they move, still claim to all thy constant care, proclaim to all thy constant care. Father of mercies, may our hearts ne'er overlook thy bounteous care, but what our Father's hand imparts, still own in grateful praise and prayer, still own in grateful praise and prayer. Just a little ways over to number 71. Seventy-one. <clears throat> As the deer pants for the water, so my soul longs after you. You alone are my heart's desire, and I long to worship you. strength, my shield. To you alone may my spirit yield. You alone are my heart's desire, and I long to worship you. I want you more than gold or silver, only you can satisfy. You alone are the real joy giver and the apple of my eye. You my strength, my shield, to you alone may my spirit yield. You alone are my 
heart's desire and I long to worship you. To prepare our minds for the Lord's Supper, uh, let's turn our books to number 383. Jesus, keep me near the cross, there a precious fountain, free to all a healing stream, flows from Calvary's mountain. In the cross, in the cross, be my glory ever, till my raptured soul shall find rest beyond the river. Near the cross a trembling soul Love and mercy found me There a bright and morning star Sheds its beams around me In the cross, in the cross be my glory ever, till my raptured soul shall find rest beyond the river. Near the cross, O Lamb of God, bring it seems before me help me walk from day to day with the shadows o'er me in the cross in the cross be my glory Till my raptured soul shall find rest beyond the river. We come to the part of the service that we uh, think about the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ. We call it communion or the Lord's Supper. We observe this on every first day of the week because we're commanded to do that in our Bibles. It tells us in Acts, the 20th chapter and the seventh verse, that Christians gathered together on the first day of the week and they, break, and they broke bread. Uh, Jesus established this at the Passover, the night in which he was betrayed, and uh, he explained what the bread and the, uh, the fruit of the vine meant. And in the 11th chapter of 1 Corinthians, the Apostle Paul reiterated it, saying almost the same words about the bread being the body of our Lord and uh, the fruit of the vine being the blood of Jesus Christ. We need to remember that sacrifice that uh, was made. Uh, my lesson this evening will actually conclude with uh, a message from the cross. And we just need to remember that if we hope to live eternally with our Father, we have to have our sins forgiven, and our sins are only forgiven through the blood of Jesus, which he shed freely for us on the cross. Uh, let's uh, go to the Lord in prayer as we pray for the bread. Our Heavenly Father, we're grateful that Jesus was willing to uh, give up his body that we might live. Though he was innocent, uh, he took the sins of the world uh, upon himself. He 
just sacrificed himself, a one-time sacrifice for all, that we might have the opportunity to live with you one day. And so as we partake of this bread, we think of the body that was broken for us. I pray this in Jesus' most holy name. Amen. When the Israelites finally uh, left their captivity in Egypt, the very last of the plagues was the death of the firstborn. And the only way that the uh, plague could pass over anyone is that if they put blood on the lampposts. And so that's what they did. And there's a wonderful symbolism here as uh, we think of the, the blood that was shed by Jesus Christ that... Uh, allows the angel of death to pass from us. Oh, we'll die a physical death, but we have that uh, hope of uh, the glorious resurrection one day with our Lord. And we only have that through the shedding of the blood that uh, forgives us from sin and the guilt of our sins. Let's pray for the cup. We're so grateful that uh, you had all this in your plans, dear Heavenly Father. And we're so grateful that Jesus was willing to carry that out and go to the cross, that he was willing to shed his innocent blood so that sacrifices of that type would not have to be made anymore because he made the one and perfect sacrifice. As we partake of this fruit of the vine, let's think of the life-giving blood that Jesus shed. We pray this in his most holy name. Amen. And each Lord's Day, uh, and this is not a part of uh, the Lord's Supper, each Lord's Day we are called upon to lay by in store uh, that which we have been prospered. And so it's at this time that we think about giving back to the Lord. And uh, we call that an offering, and it is a free will offering. Uh, and we should uh, each week designate a part of our goods uh, to give back to the Lord, because when we think of it, all good things come from him, and uh, we're just giving back to the Lord what is his. Uh, help us to give with a cheerful heart and an open pocketbook. Uh, let's pray for the giving. Our Heavenly Father, we're, we're so grateful that we are able to give, and help us to understand that you do love a cheerful giver, and help us to understand that uh, we're just giving you back what is rightfully yours. I just pray, dear Heavenly Father, that you would open our hearts and help us to understand how important this is and that uh, as a church we would be good stewards of the offerings that are given to us. I pray this in Jesus' most holy name. Amen. And that concludes the Lord's Supper and the giving. We have one more song. And uh, if you would, please... Turn your songbooks to, to number 704, 704. You'll perhaps understand through the message why I chose this as the song before the lesson. 704. Bind us together, Lord, bind us together with cords that cannot be broken. Bind us together, Lord, bind us together, Lord, bind us together, Lord, bind us together, bind us together in love. There is only one God, there is only one King. There is only one body, that is why we can sing. Bind us together, Lord, bind us together with cords that cannot be broken. Bind us together, Lord, bind us together, Lord, bind us together with love. That concludes the 
singing part of our service. I hope you enjoyed it, and uh, I pray that the Lord looked upon our songs and uh, was uh, praised in, uh, in the words that we sang and the thoughts that we expressed. If you were here this morning, you uh, heard the, I guess, somewhat unusual title of uh, the lesson uh, for this evening, and uh, the, the title of our lesson is uh, Don't Be Pre-Engaged, Pre-Enraged. <laughs> I'll get my tongue untwisted. Don't be pre-enraged. You know, we've gone through a pandemic, and uh, hopefully we're seeing the light out at the end of the tunnel. But there's a worse pandemic here in, in the United States that has taken place over, say, the last six or seven months. We had a tumultuous election that divided people. Um, we had the insurrection, the invasion of the Capitol building on January the 6th. And then we've had some uh, police shootings and some uh, terrible racial issues, uh, in particular, uh, the George Floyd death uh, and the trial has, has just finished uh, in the last oh, week or so. And what these things have done to us in, in many cases, as, as a people, they have divided us. You know, every presidential election, one man wins and one man loses. And so for four years, if you uh, voted for one person and the other person was elected, we must realize that that person who was elected is now our president. And we have to treat the presidency as the presidency is to be treated. However, this past election has has divided the nation a little bit more than perhaps any election that I have ever seen in, uh, in my few years here on the earth. And so with, with that in mind, what do people do? Well, we march, we protest, uh, but one of the things that many, many people do is they take to the social media because it's a, it's a platform it, it, that's a blind platform. You don't have to move. You don't have to walk. You don't have to march. You can just say things that either are on your mind or someone else's mind that you have reproduced. And so in the uh, social media, very, very often uh, people come into it and, and tweet or go to Instagram or whichever form they take. And they spew very often. And sometimes what they spew is not very, very pleasant. And, you know, we can't close our eyes. Uh, and, uh, and I am an optic optimistic person, and optimistically hope that all of this will go away, because it won't. Things of this nature don't go away until we change our attitudes about them. We can't be pre-enraged. We can't have taken a stand before things happen already. And so, unfortunately, if we're pre-enraged when something happens, all that does is it provides an outlet. Uh, it provides an outlet uh, for the anger that has built in us because we are, unfortunately, pre-enraged. All the while, day after day, there is a cultural volcano that is building are we really so blind that we can't see the problem that's here? We, the, the problem is that people have forgotten to put God first. And we might say, and, you know, and, and there's that old statement, what would Jesus do? And, you know, th that rings true today. 
And so when we go to the Lord's word, I think that we can find the, the, uh, the answer that will narrow that cultural gulf, that cultural gulf that will narrow the chasm that divides so many people in our country and uh, keep us from uh, living in darkness, but rather to, to live in the light. And, and hopefully our attitudes and the things that we do can make changes so that we won't be in a continual volcanic stage just waiting for the next eruption. If you have your Bibles handy, if you would turn to Ephesians chapter 4, I think that God, through the Holy Spirit-inspired Apostle Paul, in four short verses has encapsulated for us how not to get pre-enraged. How, how to, to uh, not allow our opinions to be so focused that we're ready to fly off the handle at whatever happens next. God detailed in Ephesians chapter 4, verses 29 to 32. And by the way, he was talking of church relationships here. I understand that. But, you know, the church is supposed to be a microcosm of what society is about. We want everybody in the world to be our brothers and our sisters. Unfortunately, it doesn't work out that way. And so we can use the scriptures that are written specifically for there to be harmony in the church and see that they will work out so that there will be harmony also among the people of this nation. And so if you would, Ephesians chapter 4, Ephesians chapter 4, starting with verse 29. And so number one, on my list is if we want to uh, keep from being prearranged, if we want to keep from uh, spewing uh, stuff, invectives that will cause turmoil, number one, close your mouth. Now, does that sound blunt? Well, let's look at Ephesians chapter 4, verse 29, and it says, Let no unwholesome word proceed from your mouth but only such a word that is good for edification according to the need of the moment so that it will give you it will give grace to those who hear that's a polite way of saying close your mouth we're we're fooling ourselves if we think that spouting off in the social media will solve all of our problems it won't, and unfortunately, it will many times exacerbate our problems. The social media has become a platform for hate and has become, unfortunately, one of the most putrid places on earth when these nudes feeds are just people spewing words that do nothing but inflame. What are the Apostle Paul's Holy Spirit-inspired words? Let no unwholesome word proceed from your mouth, but only such a word that is good for edification. You see, when people spout off in social media, where's the edification? Where is the grace in these situations? If edification and grace are to be the goal let no unwholesome word should be what's on our keyboard. Not spewing out invectives that will only hurt. So number one, let's close our mouths. Number two, and we're going to be very blunt, cool down, cool off. If we look to verse 
31, it says, let all bitterness and wrath and anger and clamor and slander be put away from you along with all malice. I don't know about you, but this is saying, folks, before you say anything, think and cool off. Look at the problems, politics, racism, injustice. Uh, America has clearly become a bitter place, a place of clamor, a place of loud voices, of slander, of hateful speech, and of malice. And the Holy Spirit-inspired writer says, let all bitterness and wrath and anger and clamor be put away from you. That should not be a part of our rationale. It should not be a part of our thinking. The last place that bitterness, anger, wrath, clamor, and slander should be are in the words that come out of the mouths of Christians. If they are, we need to do some self-examination and we have to do some serious introspection. If we've been bitter and if we've been angry, we haven't been Christ-like. And that's our goal. What does the Apostle Paul say? He says, put them away from you. Cool down. All right, let's get on the positive side. Let's go to verse 32. The first part of verse 32 says... Be kind to one another, tenderhearted. Be kind and tenderhearted. He says, kill them with kindness. Be kind. I would project to all of you that the lack of kindness on all sides of issues is glaring. It, it's like the brightest of floodlights shining in our eyes. A wise person once said, if you aren't kind, you're the wrong kind. You can use that, by the way. If you're not kind, you're the wrong kind. Kind translates as soft and gentle, and your actions ought to follow those. The wisest man, Solomon, who ever lived in writing the Proverbs, said this, A gentle answer turns away wrath, but a harsh word stirs up anger. When people shout and spew, all that happens is that anger gets stirred out. Kindness flies right out the window. How desperately we need more people to be softer and gentler and kinder in their reactions to the tumult that is happening in our country. And finally, the second part of verse 32. Let's read the first part first because get it in context. It says, be kind to one another and tenderhearted. Get ready. Forgiving each other just as God in Christ has forgiven you. It says that we are supposed to be forgiving people. You know what? It is unmistakable that in our country, many people have been wronged. If we don't see that, we're fooling ourselves. We're like a horse with blinders on it. Or we're like a person with a, with a blindfold on. If, if we aren't seeing that, then... You know, we're not living in this world. But what we are seeing is, unfortunately, many people won't let it go. It, it, it just festers there, and it festers, and it festers. And you have to ask ourselves the question, how many people are practicing forgiveness
do we have an example of someone who was wrong in, in the worst possible way, suffered immeasurably in the worst possible way, but showed forgiveness? If you're thinking it happened 2,000 years ago on the cross, it did. Here was a man who was beaten, whipped, had a crown of thorns placed on his head, was nailed to a wooden cross, and he hung on that cross. He suffered on that cross. Yet in some of the remaining moments that he had in his life, he didn't spew out invectives at people. Why'd you do this to me? This trial was unfair, even though it was. What he said in Luke chapter 23, 34 is, Father, forgive them, for they do not know what they are doing. Jesus set the bar for us when it came to forgiveness. What do we do when that happens? We lower the temperature. He was saying that to the people around him. He was even saying that to his disciples, many of whom had fled. But he was saying, don't, don't carry that with you like a torch. On the day of Pentecost, when Peter preached that first vital uh, sermon, he told the people that they had crucified their Jesus. He told those Jewish people that they had crucified the Messiah. He didn't pull any punches, but he did not castigate them to the point where he said, well, you're, you're, you're in deep now. You have no chance for salvation because the very people that crucified Jesus repented and confessed that Jesus was the Son of God. And Peter said, you can be forgiven of this. Lower the temperature. And so let's review the four things and the lesson will be yours. First, think before you speak. Close your mouth. Don't let unwholesome words come forth from your mouth. And by the way, that includes what you put on the keyboard, because if you throw it out on the keyboard and throw it out to everybody, you're talking it. It's the same thing. We're fooling ourselves if we don't believe that. Before we even think about writing, before we even think about, about talking, cool down first. Let the bitterness and the wrath and the anger be put away from you. Thirdly, treat people with kindness. Be kinder. Be gentler. Uh, the lack of kindness is glaring. And finally, make sure that we have a forgiving spirit just the same way that Jesus did. Are we living in tumultuous times? We are. Do we live in a world that almost seems to be exploding in some sort of a way around us? Yes. But you know what? As Christians, we don't have to be those people. Let's make sure that we take Ephesians chapter 4, verses 29 to 32 to heart, to have the self-control and the courage to respond the way God has told us to respond. I hope this message uh, uh, just kind of struck home. Uh, as I studied it, uh, I just thought of the, the, uh, the truth that are in these words and uh, how powerful they are. I pray that uh, all of you have come to the Lord already. But if you have not, we offer that invitation to you this evening. Although we are in a virtual sense, uh, if you feel the need to come to the Lord in baptism, if you would just uh, contact one of us, we will be at your beck and call, and we will help you to uh, get yourself into the Lord. If you need to confess, 
please do that. Do that silently to the Lord tonight if you have that need. And so whatever that need might be, make sure that you voice it to us if it has to be voiced. Let's pray together. Our Heavenly Father, we're grateful that uh, you're our God. We're grateful that at the right time you sent Jesus to us. And although we know we do not live in a perfect world because we are imperfect people, we know that within your word, uh, there are the words that will allow us to live in such a way that uh, we can show uh, the love that Jesus showed uh, as he walked this earth. Bless us and help us to be more Christ-like, more godly in our lives, that people might see Jesus living within us. And although all of us can't be preachers, all of us can't be evangelists, all of us can't be missionaries, all of us can be witnesses in the way that we live. Help us not to be afraid to witness for the Lord in the way that we live our lives. Be with us through the evening and help us to uh, put our head on the pillow tonight and be thinking of you and wake up in the morning the same way. I just pray this prayer in Jesus' most holy name. Amen. Please be safe and may God bless you all.